FIFA is no more. In its place comes EA Sports FC, a fresh start for the world's biggest soccer franchise, which, for the rest of this video, I'll be calling football, because that's just the proper thing to do. For a generation of football-loving gamers, FIFA is all they've ever known. Playing as your favourite team in career mode, creating your greatest fantasy side and ultimate team, jumping online to rank up in seasons mode, that isn't just an option for footy-loving gamers, it's the only option. But things never used to be this way. Sure, your dad still plays football manager during family dinner, and there's whatever the hell eFootball's supposed to be. But, you know, there used to be a whole lot more to the world of football games. And it was all a bit weird. Oh, on my head. Ah. <sighs> Roll titles. This is EA Sports FC 24. Looks great, doesn't it? A generation of video games that extends back over 30 years, the latest title from EA may be different by name, but will very much remain the same game that millions of FIFA players have come to expect. But there are some new elements, like improved player animations, and unique play styles bestowed on the most iconic players. Career modes will look much more like an early version of Football Manager, with in-depth training and backroom management. And female players have finally been introduced to Ultimate Team, meaning you can have the Sam Kerr slash Erling Haaland frontline to really stick it to those who still think women can't play the beautiful game. EAFC is made by a team who've been making games like this for a very long time. It's their bread and butter, and I'm sure we'll all have fun playing it, while finding the usual things to complain about. Egregious microtransactions you still pay for anyway, a lack of innovation or creative ideas, general criticism of EA being a horrible publisher and the source of all of gaming's ills. I completely agree with you on that. But you know what? EA's football video games weren't always this competent. FIFA International Soccer came out in 1993 and has aged terribly. The main issue is the game's perspective. Other football titles at the time used a side-on 2D perspective meaning you could see most of the pitch and players during the game. You know, like when you watch football on TV. But EA had a better idea. Let's shift things to an isometric perspective. Sure, when you were attacking up the pitch, you could see everything in front of you. But attacking the other end, you were basically screwed. You couldn't see where you were running, where any of your teammates were, or any of the opposition players about to take the ball off you. I know there were hardware limitations in the early 90s, but seriously, who thought this was a good idea? Don't think it was just the early days of EA football games that were rubbish either. Their attempt to bring FIFA to the Wii in 2008 is something else they'd rather you forget. To account for the limitations of the hardware, EA decided that rather than take their PS3 and Xbox 360 game and reduce its graphical fidelity, they'd instead build a more child-friendly, accessible football game, utilising the console's motion technology. The results were a disaster. <laughs> Not only did EA force these controls into classic matches, flailing the Wiimote about to pass, tackle or run forward in some vague direction, but they also added a host of mini-games using the Mii characters, turning it into a cross between Mario Party and a kickabout in the park. They also created exclusive Miis, featuring some of the world's best players at the time, including Ronaldinho and Wayne Rooney. And they were absolutely terrifying. But it's not fair to just dig at EA for bizarre and terrible football games. The history of the genre is littered with them. Like Red Card. Not only is it a fairly ugly football game that doesn't play particularly well, but it introduced the gimmick of encouraging the sort of bad tackles and general violence that'll make Vinnie Jones blush. Yeah, it sounds great, but then you realise that most of football isn't actually smashing into other players, but just kicking the ball around and running about. So yeah, the game was kind of tedious. Or Pure Football, a game backed by Steven Gerrard, but seemingly written by Alan Partridge. Oh, you know who made this? Ubisoft. Yeah, Ubisoft made a football game. Go figure. Then there's Codemasters Club Football. I remember asking for this for my birthday back in the early 2000s. It wasn't actually a bad idea. A bunch of individual football games based on one specific club. 
Now remember, at the time there weren't official stadiums, managers or most player likenesses in the big football titles. So having the opportunity to role play as your favourite club was incredibly exciting. So when my parents brought me Pro Evolution Soccer instead, I was at first disappointed. But in hindsight, it was the best damn thing they've ever done for me. There have also been a whole host of rubbish football games with licences shoved onto them to try and boost sales. For example, did you know there was a LEGO football game? Yes, LEGO Soccer Mania, bringing the thrills and excitement of a match day onto a pitch covered in studs. Unlike actual LEGO, it isn't much fun. Capcom also wanted in on the football action at one time, and what better character to bring onto the field than Mega Man? That's right, Mega Man Soccer on the SNES is a real thing. With the number of different enemies and bosses in the series, you could imagine a lot of fun in using various abilities to mix things up. Except it doesn't do that. Not at all. Especially compared to Mario Strikers. Yes, this is a licensed football game that's actually really good. Still completely bizarre, but good. Being made by Nintendo, that shouldn't really be a surprise. They're as good at making games as they are bad at understanding the internet, and Strikers is no exception. Playing as teams captained by your favourite characters from the Mario franchise, the gameplay's really solid and loads of fun with friends. This is the way to step outside the box with a sports game. Not like this, or this, and definitely not like this. Still weird to see Waluigi sly tackle Princess Peach into an advertising hoarding, mind you. And then there's the whole dirge of football video games that shoved a famous footballer onto them to try and give them legitimacy. Oh boy, there's a lot. Gaz's Super Soccer, Glenn Hoddle Soccer, John Barnes European Football, Emlyn Hughes International Soccer, Pelé Soccer, Marcel Desailly Pro Soccer, Gary Lineker's Superstar Soccer, Chris Kamara Street Soccer, the list goes on and on. I mean, even Sean Dundee had a game and who the hell remembers him? And some of these games are just outright ridiculous. Take Brian Clough's Football Fortunes, a hybrid video game and tabletop management simulator that was supposed to revolutionise the world of sports gaming forever. And look, the game itself isn't actually that bad, but no one's organising their Ultimate Team Force 9 system with 92 chemistry on a piece of cardboard at the kitchen table now, are they? Or how about, and get ready for this, Go Go Beckham Adventure on Soccer Island. A 2D platformer on the Game Boy Advance, you play as the titular David Beckham on a quest to defeat the evil Mr. Woe in order to restore peace to Soccer Island. I don't care if it isn't a bad game. I mean, come on, just look at it. Jesus Christ. So all other football games that aren't FIFA were too weird or too rubbish to make an impact, right? Well, no. In fact, way before Ultimate Team was even a glint in Andrew Wilson's eye, there was the granddaddy of football games. The one that changed what they could be for young people in their bedrooms all across the world. Sensible soccer. For those of a younger generation, you may look at sensible soccer and wonder what people in the 90s were smoking. Top-down view, blocky characters, made-up team and player names and a complete lack of realism. Yeah, this can't possibly have been popular. But the 1992 game released by the small British studio Sensible Software was a massive hit among football fans everywhere. The gameplay was fast and dynamic, the controls tight and responsive, and the fact almost everything could be customised meant that you could, with a bit of time and effort, recreate basically any league or tournament you wanted. This was something no other sports game offered, the potential to recreate the entire Premier League, all the teams, players and kits, with 100% accuracy. Again, this was 1992, it was a, a very different time. Sensible Soccer and its sequel, Sensible World of Soccer, often find themselves in lists of the top 10 sports games of all time, and the legacy of these titles cannot be understated. Gamers found a game that they could play even if they had no interest in football. Curiously, Deus Ex creator Warren Spector was among its fans. And Football Nuts had a game that felt closer to the real thing than anything they'd had before. If you were to name the three most iconic video game franchises of all time, Sensible Soccer would be right beside FIFA on that list. The third would probably be the only game series to seriously threaten the modern day phenomenon of EA's juggernaut. In Japan, it was called International Superstar Soccer, but in the West, we know it as Pro Evo. It's weird to think in 2023 that Konami used to be a powerhouse in the gaming industry. Silent Hill, Metal Gear Solid, Castlevania, and Pro Evolution Soccer, four franchises that made huge impacts on gamers around the world. It was its football franchise that has proved its most lucrative and long-lasting, and for a few years in the mid-2000s, it was the king of the pitch. There was a time when the FIFA versus PES argument was akin to the console war. 
With each new game, EA and Konami had to push to innovate and break new ground to stay ahead. But while FIFA had the licenses and official tournaments, its gameplay was lacklustre compared to a game in which West Ham were called Lake District and Manchester United Aragon. Yes, we were actually willing to ignore all of that to play a game with superior mechanics, more enjoyable gameplay, and an overall much better selection of single and multiplayer modes. Ask anyone of a certain generation and they can name the legendary Master League team of Ivarov, Zimeles, Minanda and Costolo. I wonder what the lads are doing now. But it didn't last long for Konami, as FIFA quickly caught up with ever-improving technology, meaning the one advantage Konami had was quickly disappearing. By the end of the 2000s, both games were basically on a par with each other, and with FIFA retaining all the teams and players it always had, Pro Evo began to fade into obscurity. It didn't help that in 2009, FIFA would introduce its pièce de résistance in the form of Ultimate Team, a game mode that would come to simply be football video games for an entirely new generation of players. The genesis of Ultimate Team came in 2007 in the FIFA spin-off game UEFA Champions League 2006-07. It looks similar to the Ultimate Team we know today, with bronze, silver and gold packs to collect, building your team and formation, and chemistry all included. But as this was 2007, there was no way to use real money to buy players, and instead, coins would be earned exclusively through gameplay. Oh god, those were the days. The Ultimate Team we know today first appeared in FIFA 09, introducing the aforementioned microtransactions and cemented FIFA as the only football game you'd ever need. Every fan of a certain generation played Ultimate Team and bought FIFA every single year so they could build their squads and take on others around the world over and over again. You could argue Ultimate Team was a phenomenon that virtually transcended football video games altogether. Ultimate Team's runaway success cemented FIFA as the franchise we all know today and its impact on football and gaming culture is astounding. Not only do clubs and TV channels make content around fuck player ratings, but FIFA has become intertwined in how football is covered on TV. The game's UI is used as part of analysis, and its graphics engine is used to show replays and key moments in games. The competitive scene has taken off too, with the FIFA E-World Cup becoming the premier esports tournament for sports games, bringing in hundreds of thousands of viewers and evolving into a mainstay of the circuit. We're now at the point where FIFA is football gaming, rather than just the leader of the pack. But of course, FIFA as we know it is no more. In its place comes EA Sports FC, and with it, well, very little else, sadly. EA had the opportunity here for a fresh start, but to the surprise of almost nobody, they haven't. But you know what? Despite the horrendous monetization practices, despite the lack of innovation, despite the developers being completely nonplussed about doing anything about it, we should still be glad that we have an extremely well-made, extremely fun football video game to play. Things weren't always like this. There was a time when football games were utter chaos and quality titles were very much in the minority. Developers would throw almost anything at the wall, trying to see what stuck, and gamers had no real idea where to go for the best recreation of the sport they loved. Today, though, you know exactly where to go for that rush of scoring a goal from your sofa. FIFA, no, wait, EAFC is where you want to be. Oh, no, actually, wait, there's one more game I wanted to talk about. The other great football game of the last decade. You should play that.